Beautiful, beautiful words of twice. Thank you for that. Thank you for your great words this afternoon. We are slowly um, trickling more participants um, for our um, third gathering. So it's really good to see folks. And I'm starting to see in the chat box that folks are starting to their uh, swag box. So it's good to see. Um, I know that uh, folks were eagerly, eagerly waiting to see that, but um, but yeah, once again, that's twice. Thank you for opening us up in such a good way. Um, so for folks, I'm getting ready to record this afternoon's session. And so with our opening, we're going to follow with uh, Dr. Donica Brown. Um, most of you, some of you have um, been able to witness and experience her land acknowledgements. And so I just wanted to um, share that again with, with our participants today. And uh, this activity that she shares with us is such a rooted, grounding moment that I'm glad that she's able to share some time with us. So thank you, Donica. Thanks, Tanya. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's really, really good to be here and to share this space with you and in our rich virtual world, share that sacred breath that brings us all together. Um, and so today I'm gonna do a little bit of a different um, grounding activity than the land acknowledgement yesterday, but it still is centering around our relationship with this blessed Mother Earth that we have. And so um, I just would like to invite everyone to get comfortable in their seats, wherever you're at. And just take a moment to get centered on this ground. If you can, um, I'd like to invite you to put your feet square on the ground and take a deep breath in. And release it. Take another deep breath. I would like to invite you to imagine where you're sitting, the sacred mother earth energy coming up through the ground that energy that is loving, cherishing, nurturing, healing energy coming up through your feet. And I'd like for you to imagine it just coming up through your body and holding you, protecting you, healing you, and whatever, and providing you everything that you need to live on this, on this earth. Imagine that sacred energy coming up through your legs into your pelvis. And take a deep breath in and imagine that energy just being in your body. Now I'd like to invite you to imagine the sacred father sky energy coming down. The energy from our ancestors, from your relatives, that ancestral knowledge that is passed down in our blood, in our DNA. Like to invite you to imagine that, that energy, that father sky energy coming down through the top of your head and awakening all of the neurons in your brain so that you feel awake and rejuvenated for this time that we're sharing together so that we can learn and grow, share our stories, share our time together. Imagine that energy coming down to your neck, through your shoulders, guiding you, offering you solace. Take another deep breath. Now I'd like to invite you to imagine the sacred fire within you, the sacred energy that you bring as an individual human being into this world. 
that sacred fire that ignites in you every day when you wake up and give thanks for being here. That sacred energy that gives you the motivation to do the work that you do in your communities, to take care of yourself and your families, to live long, healthy lives. I like for you to imagine that sacred energy expanding out and spiraling, connecting with the energy of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Imagine these three energies expanding around you, guiding you, protecting you. And just spend one more moment deeping, taking deep breaths in with these three energies. And just spend a moment experiencing that spiraling energy out. Take a few deep breaths in. Another deep breath in. I would just like to invite you to slowly come back to this virtual world, the space and this time. If there's any point in your day, um, any point in your week where you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling sad or or you just want to feel that connection back to these three sacred energies. I just want to invite you to just take those deep breaths and, and use that grounding um, exercise to work through and, and, and to, you know, get grounded and centered in the work that we do. What you do is so important to our communities and it's important that we we take care of ourselves. So I just wanna offer that throughout this afternoon sessions and um, you know, to just open up those, those neurons and, and learn and grow from each other, but also take care of yourself. So I wanna thank you again for that time and, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to do this. Tanya, I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I know that we appreciate you spending your your um you know your your afternoon with us. So <sighs> thank you. I, I needed that. <laughs> I don't know about other folks, but I'm sure you probably needed that too. Me too. I'm looking at um, our um, plethora of names in our Zoom meeting. We have over 50 folks joining us this afternoon. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge everyone that's with us. We know that everyone has a busy schedule. We know that, um, you know, there's, we have a demanding job. We have a demanding lives. And I know that, um, and I know that our team truly appreciates the time and dedication that you've taken to spend the afternoon with us. I've noticed that, um, our previous keynote presenters, Marilyn, Twice, Martina, have joined us this afternoon. And I just wanted to say, I truly, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you continuing that commitment to our behavioral health aid program. So thank you, thank you for that. And so as we move forward with our agenda, I wanted to, um, I would like to introduce you to uh, one of our precious um, staff members, program members, Sue Stewart. Sue Stewart is a member of the Cub Creek Nation here in Oregon. She is our former CHAP director, and she is currently our Portland Area CHAP Certification Board Chair. She's also the Deputy Director of the Northwest Portland Air and Health Board, and I just proudly and humbly um so happy that uh, she's spending the afternoon with us so sue thank you yeah, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction they do yapa to all the hello and welcome all people 
want to thank Donna for that beautiful experience. That connection is so very important. The Wook, it is good. It is good to remember our ancestors who walked here before us, and it is good to remember our traditions and our ceremonies, our plant med medicine, and our traditional foods, and that we are all always connected to one another and to this land through those wonderful energies that Donica shared with us this, this afternoon. Dewook, it is good to be here with you today as we share with one another. Kwikuya mahan, kwitak baraka, su steward, nahan guru dana iite. My friends, I am called su steward, I am of the Cow Creek people. I am the daughter of Luella Rondo Odell. She was of the Cow Creek Wardahu clan and the Umpqua, Kalapuya, Walla Walla, Umatilla, Nez, Person, Iroquois peoples. My father was Daryl O'Dell, an Irish and Pennsylvania Dutch settler. My grandmother was Diora Rondo, an English settler. Does somebody have a question? Oh, sorry, okay. My grandmother was Theora Rondo. Um, she was an English settler. And my grandfather was George Gans Rondo of the Cow Creek Wardahu clan and the Umpqua, Kalapuya, Walla Walla, Umatilla, Nez, Person, Iroquois people. At this time, I want us to all take a moment and recognize and acknowledge Tanya Firemoon for this space and time that we share here, here at the third semi-annual gathering of Northwest elders, knowledge holders and culture keepers. I ask, can we please lift our hands up to her? She is the backbone of this. She's a heart and soul. And she is, she is a very spiritual individual who I admire. I want to make the intent of this this beginning of our students' mentor journey in how they develop their recipe based on culture, traditions, and ceremonies, to identify our community's strengths and resilience by providing the appropriate cultural response. I see that we gathered here today, well over 50. I believe that who show up is who is supposed to be here. I believe those who are each be awakened to some new concept day, and those who care will share something that will help or support another being. I apologize for that. My internet is down. I'm going to stop my video so that you can hear me. My apologies. On our agenda today, we have an amazing lineup for you. Tanya Fireman is providing us with guidance for the afternoon for this gathering. Katie Hunsberger will update us on the BHA education program and student recruitment efforts. Itai Jeffries, little bit of my heart here, um, will be sharing about remembering our two spirit relatives. And then after break, respected tribal leader Marilyn Scott will share about tribal leadership career perspectives. I look forward to hearing from each of our speakers. I also hope to hear from each of you with hopes of your stories being shared or perhaps she will contact Tanya about uh, speaking at a future gathering. I want to share a bit today about why I believe these gatherings are so important. When I was young, I spent most of my early years with my maternal grandparents. They were my stability. They sustained and loved me, and they kept me safe when I needed that. My grandfather would quietly share with me about his childhood and why he never wanted me to go into the system. He talked about how people used to come and take our children. And he talked about how he and his brothers, um, sisters and friends were treated by the Catholic nuns when they would speak our native language or even when they would huddle together for comfort or play. He would secretly share with me about our ceremonies and traditions. But honestly, I wish I paid more attention. I have snippets of memory 
teaching. And he did not talk openly about our ceremonies as he had been subjected to punishment as a child and told it was against the law. These er early childhood experiences impacted him greatly. His desire was to see us able to share and experience our culture in a way that was stripped from him. And I'm thankful for his teachings on plant medicine and traditional foods, and that I was raised in a subsistence lifestyle of hunting and gathering uh, what was needed. I am thankful that he taught me to respect my elders, that he was firm but fair in his teachings. And I am thankful that each of you are here today. I appreciate each of our elders who are here today and I encourage you to share with you, our young adults. They need your guidance, your teachings, and your fair discipline. Our BHA students benefit from your guidance in a way that we may never understand as they go out into their communities to to help the healing by spreading your wisdom and by using your guidance to reach into our communities and help those who need it the most. In closing, I just want to thank our elders for helping us all be proud of our heritage, for holding up our values and engaging our people in a way that lets them be who they are. Open doors for them to be culture keepers, tribal leaders, storytellers, and just integral parts, you know, people who, um, practice our ceremonies. I want to also encourage each of you to steal shamelessly from one another, learning about the practices of others because we are all related. I do wish that we could all gather together and share in ceremony or gathering events, but until that day is once again an option, I am so thankful to see each of you virtually gathered here. Duuk, it is good. And I thank you. Um, and Tanya, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful word, too. My heart right now is like overflowing. So, <laughs> well, this event couldn't have happened without the love and compassion and support of our program and our community. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Like I said, it's just, it's the support of, of many of many folks. Uh, we are actually ahead of our schedule, but what I'd like to do is kind of recap our time that we spent yesterday afternoon. Yesterday, we had. Um, the liberty of um, spending time with Alexis from the National Indian Child Welfare Association. As she shared the relational worldview, she shared some of the framework and the process for assessments for individual and organization levels. Uh, we had a presentation from Riley from NAA, who uh, provided um, a schematic of how they work with their house's community members, you know, with the community outreach. And we also had Dr. Donica Brown with us yesterday, talking about case management, identifying existing resources, networking, and methods of prioritizing when we're working with our service with our uh, community members in our in our clients and our patients. And we also had a couple of different wellness activities, um, including Jenny with Naya. Thanks, Donica. Thank you for spending your day your time with us. Um, and she provided her cottonwood salve recipe and she was just so funny. So I appreciate her time with us. And so as we for move forward with our agenda today, I'd like to introduce Katie Hunsberger. She's our student recruitment coordinator and she's gonna share with us what's been going on uh, in our behavioral health aid education program and the recruitment efforts that she's been wholeheartedly supporting the past year. So Katie, the floor is yours. Mahamga Nuwa, Mia Molich, Katie Hunsberger. My friends, my name is Katie Hunsberger. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a member of the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation in Fort McDowell, Arizona. My homelands are the areas around the Sedona Desert. We are people of the sun. I'm currently um, living um, in Portland, Oregon. 
um, this beautiful lands of the Pacific Northwest. I am the Behavioral Health Aid, BHA, Student Support Coordinator for the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, working for the Tribal Community Health Provider Project team. Um, a little bit about uh, myself. I um, am a student as well. I am currently pursuing a doctorate's degree in educational leadership with a specialization in post-secondary education. I um, was honored to work with Riley and Jenny at Native American Youth and Family Center as a youth advocate working with um, Native youth and kiddos in the Portland area. I then worked for my tribe as a foster care specialist working with families, Yavapai youth, moved back to Portland to pursue this role. Um, it's been really special. Um, also a hard time working through COVID. Um, learning more about behavioral health is important to myself and my family and those that I care for. So this program um, is really something that I admire and have been really loving working with my team, the academic institutions, the elders, the advisory work groups, um, so I'm just really appreciative to share this space with you, and I'm going to share my screen and talk to you about the Tribal BHA educa education program that we have been diligently working on the past year, um, and those before me, another two years getting it started. So I will begin my presentation. Can you all see my screen okay? Okay, I hope so. I don't see the head nods, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that you can see it. Um, so like I said, the, the BHA education program is up and running. I'm gonna be presenting it. Katie Hunsberger as the BHA student support coordinator. Like I said, I'm currently in school, um, so I'm doing a lot of reading and textbooks, feeling very inspired. This is just a quote um, that I came across when I was reading, and it reads, after 400 years of experience as the oppressed Native peoples of our country, it is time we implemented the concept of self-determination as Native Americans and assert control over our lives. By controlling the education of our young through Native American studies, we are molding the Native American of tomorrow with the attributes of warrior, scholar, and community activist. But the finished product can only result through us as Native American educators and, and those pursuing education, taking the initiative to incorporate time-tried perspectives into the new academic sphere of Native American studies. So that is a quote by Dr. Henrietta Whiteman, who is from Cheyenne Tribe. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, what are we gonna cover today? I'm gonna give you some information and background um, information on behavioral health aids, who can be a BHA, scope of work, what is a BHA um, job kind of entail. And then I'm gonna talk about um, our recruitment for the new Northwest BHA education program. And then I'm gonna kind of discuss the student benefits and support um, that we are providing the students for this very first Northwest cohort. To give you a little bit of background about BHAs, um, this program started in Alaska. It is the first time it's being implemented in the lower 48 states. In the early 1990s, Alaska began establishing a need for a BHA model. The Alaska legislator established a rural human services system project and funded village-based counselors in 40 villages. In the early 2000s, the Indian Health Service funds were provided by Congress to develop a BHA program, uh, which was done in Alaska. Then in 2009, the process for establishing and certifying BHAs in Alaska was fulfilled and the first BHA was certified. In 2016, the Community Health Aid Program expanded to other Indian Health Service areas. Then in 2018, as mentioned, Sue Stewart, the advisory work group members from um, 43 different tribes began the development of a BHA program in the Northwest area 
there was a need, um, visible need that behavioral health needed to be implemented and strategized and worked through for tribal communities. So that work, um, very hard work and collaboration has led us to 2020. Um, I started this position in September of 2020. So little, just a little over a bit of a year now, and I have been able to join this team. Members of the TCHPV team started to collaborate heavily with the advisory work group continuously, Heritage University, Northwest Indian College, tribes and health departments to identify prospective students to start the Northwest Tribal BHA education program. I wanted to introduce the BHA logo. It's over here on the left. It was created by Corey Begay, who is Dene. It's a little bit about Corey in this little bubble over here, um, but I wanted to walk through it. Um, this is from Corey, it's Corey's words. The meaning story behind the logo design I've created was to encompass representation from the Northwest tribes in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Let's start from the bottom. I created roots as a visual to represent the high plains tribes for food, medicine, and many other things. The next layer up is water from the major rivers to the smaller rivers and water sources throughout the Northwest, giving life to many things, including salmon. The three salmon inside the water I wanted to represent the three states. Third is the land, a resource for tools, travel, material, et cetera, and has provided Northwest tribes with everything needed to carry on life, culture, and wellness. The baskets are a small representation of that as they are viewed under the trees. Lastly is the eagle. The eagle blesses our paths, our travels, and our lifestyles to keep us going in a healthy direction. Within the illustration, the eagle is overlooking all the other elements and continues to bless the land. So moving forward, this is the BHA logo that you'll probably see on a lot of your goodie, goodie items in the box. And we'll be using it throughout the duration of our Northwest program. And we're really thankful for Corey for designing that. So what is the definition of a BHA? BHA is like I said, we're first implemented in Alaska through the Alaska Native Health Consortium, ANTHC. Their definition of a BHA is a counselor, a health educator, and advocate. BHAs help address individual and community-based behavioral health needs, including those related to alcohol, drug, and tobacco abuse, as well as mental health problems such as grief, depression, suicide, and related issues. BHAs seek to achieve balance in the community by integrating their sensitivity to cultural needs, with specialized training in behavioral health concerns and approaches to treatment. Who do they serve? BHAs serve elders, they serve youth, families, adolescents, individuals, anyone in the community who's going into the health department. What are some of the similar roles to a BHA who, that are currently in place in a behavioral health department? Um, those could be peer recovery mentors, peer support specialists, traditional health workers, community health workers and representatives. That list goes on, um, but these are just a few examples. Who can be a BHA? What are some of the qualities to look for in someone when you are thinking of sending this opportunity to someone? I think a great example could be someone who is a natural helper, someone who is an advocate, an advocate for not only themselves, but their community, um, who also craved to tie in cultural activities into their day-to-day -day work. Um, their community members, their tribal members, their homegrown collective of people committed to serving a tribal community, not just their tribal community even, maybe just um, one that is closer to them, one that they're living near, but it could also be their own tribal community, of course. Um, they're also counselors. They're good listeners, they're empaths, they're aunties and uncles, they're storytellers, they're people who are able to hear other stories and um, turn that into something beautiful, giving that uh, equal uh, good medicine. They're also holistic caregivers and healers who would like to utilize tribal traditional practices, um, not just only with their own tribe, but other tribes in the Pacific Northwest. 
so that if someone from another tribe is coming in, they kind of know those, um, those cultural practices and are open to experiencing that with uh, their client. So BHA can encompass all of these things. They don't need to. Um, that's something that they can kind of learn throughout their experience, but these are just really good qualities to kind of look for um, when you're thinking about who can be a, a good BHA. Here's kind of a breakdown of some of the things that they'll be doing um, day to day. And this is also kind of embedded in the curriculum. Um, but I just wanted to give examples. I won't read through every single one of them, but um, some good examples are community prevention activities. That could be community potlucks, recognition walks, MMIW, suicide awareness, community parades, doing culture classes to tie in that um, culture is medicine. So um, if, uh, BHA is wanting to um, build those relationships and rapport with uh, their clients, basket weaving, um, beading, um, canning, totem carving, all of that is included um, in community prevention. Screening and assessment, gathering information, using appropriate screening tools and forms, assessing and identifying client needs, health education that can look like group facilitation, parenting classes, anger management, self-care, mental health promotion, um, using those um, conscious disciplines such as Native Stand, Will Bridey, Sons and Daughters of Tradition, 49 Days of Ceremony, um, really taking that, that Native made curriculum and implementing it into health education. Um, it also includes case management and referrals, um, addressing resources needed, providing access, working with integrative care team and other departments in a tribal health organization, and also uh, providing those service links and referrals. It also can include early intervention and crisis intervention and also post prevention So these are um, a few of the things uh, day to day that a VHA, um, and I think the important thing to note here is that it can really be anyone. Um, you know, not just um, a peer counselor or um, someone who has a very specific job title can be anyone working for the tribe who kind of is already doing some of these things day to day. It's about providing a larger scope of work so that they can implement various bubble, various pieces of these bubbles to really create something um, beautiful and specific to what the tribe needs. All of those bubbles are extremely important, but most importantly, BHA strive to incorporate culture into their work, their day-to-day -day work. Behavioral health aides and practitioners are educated in traditional healing, spiritual healing as mentored by tribal respected practitioners, elders, mentors, knowledge holders, and culture keepers providing holistic care for their community. At the core, this is the most important because we are hoping to provide a curriculum that's trauma-informed, taking it to the next level, learning from elders and mentors and um, healing ourselves so that you know, we're healing the healers so that they can go and heal communities. What are some of the services that BHAs provide? Um, kind of broken it down uh, through a BHA level one and a BHA level two. So below you'll kind of see these examples of what BHAs can kind of in their first year of work start out doing. This can include wellness promotion, talking circles on behavioral health, education, advocacy on behavioral health, doing community needs assessment. Um, like I said, screening intakes, referrals, crisis management, case management, um, and then on the higher level, we're kind of uh, on BHA two level, we're kind of focusing more on substance use disorder, um, tying that in treatment planning, um, implementation, community readiness assessment, and also family interventions and counseling. Um, an important note in Alaska, they have a BHA level one, two, three, and practitioner, BHAP. Um, we are not currently, um, doing the BHA three and practitioner yet, although we have been working closely with the advisory work groups and the schools to kind of think about long-term opportunities and what that can look like. So um, it's not being offered immediately, but maybe in the near future, um, depending on the needs and, and the feedback that we get for this first cohort.
what are some of the certification requirements? So to be certified as a BHA, uh, they'll be certified through the Portland area um, CHAP certification board, which was just recently established. Though they'll be getting their degree or certificate from the institution, the certifying body will be the um, Portland area CHAP certification board, as I mentioned. Um, but some of the things, the main things that they'll need, they'll need 2,000 hours of work experience. So 1,000 during BHA 1, another 1,000 um, during their BHA 2, um, and 2,000 hours is equivalent to one year of, of work. Under a clinical supervisor, um, you will need a master's level clinical supervisor that has kind of been a barrier for some tribes. So um, Dr. Brown has been working, um, doing really great work. Um, recruiting clinical supervisors who can provide that supervision for BHAs um, if that is a barrier for a tribe. They'll also need all the completed coursework at their chosen institution, and they'll also need 200 practicum hours that are specific. The board will provide an Excel log where they can easily track. Um, they'll need like 25 hours uh, specific to one kind of job duty, another 25 specific to another. Um, it's 100 hours um, per year, um, and like I said, we provide that lot to make sure that students are uh, keeping track of that and that it's accessible. Now I kind of want to talk about the recruitment for our um, Northwest Tribal BHA Education Program. It's being offered through the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. It's a Northwest cohort. We're really excited. Like I said, it's been a really long time of building and developing. So now we're extremely excited to start recruiting students. This is a flyer that you may or may not have seen being dispersed. Um, like I said, the board is recruiting up to 12 students per academic institution to be a part of the very first Northwest BHA education program cohort. Um, we are really wanting to set up a solid cohort who is dedicated to two years of education um, and get them started, get, um, get them in the program. Um, so if you know anyone who is interested, um, please kind of, you know, be thinking about who would kind of have those qualities and be a good BHA. The two academic institutions that will be offering this program, um, the amazing Heritage University and the excellent Northwest Indian College. Um, Heritage University is a private university in Toppenish, Washington, near the Yakima Nation. They will be offering a behavioral health aid certificate, um, a two-year program for the certificate. They are semester-based. Um, and they will be offering mostly in-person classes with some online sessions. So that's important to know, depending on your availability um, and the distance from which you are to Heritage. Um, the second institution is Northwest Indian College, their tribal college in Bellingham, Washington. They will be offering an associates in technical arts and ATA and chemical dependency, also two years. Um, they are quarter slash term based and they will be offering mostly online courses for this very first cohort. Here's a map just to kind of give you a better idea of um, where you are in location to, to both schools. Heritage is um, probably about three hours away from Portland. And then you've got Northwest Indian College up here kind of more north of, um, north of Washington. Um, our team also created a decision-making matrix. So prospective students um, can be degree holding and they cannot be degree holding. We're, like I said, it's really open to anyone and we wanted to provide pathways that make it easy for someone who may have a, a degree in something or maybe they're just starting off their educational journey. So this pathway kind of breaks down if you are degree holding, um, you would more likely kind of be um, wanting to attain a certificate, but maybe not necessarily. We kind of keep this open. Um, and then it kind of breaks down if you want that mostly online preference or if you want that in-person hybrid. 
Um, one thing to note here is that both institutions will be starting in January of 2022. And like I said, one institution is quarter and the other is semester. So one is winter and when the other is spring, but they both are starting in January 2022. Um, and this is something that the behavioral health aid director and myself can walk through with you to, or the prospective student to kind of help them uh, get that decision on where they want to go, where would be the better fit for them. So this is a curriculum that was kind of guiding um, Heritage University and Northwest Indian College. This is a list of ANTHC's courses. Um, they will not be exactly the same for either institution. It was kind of like a guide um, in doing a gap analysis to pick the courses specific to the certificate and the chemical dependency degree. Um, but these are the courses that um, are going through ANTHC's BHAs. Um, these are things that they'll be learning. And like I said, this is um, the first Northwest uh, curriculum. So it'll look a little bit different than this. But I did want to provide it just to kind of give you um, an idea of what the course schedule could look like. Um, both institutions are submitting your uh, curriculum packets currently. Um, so the finalized courses um, will be available as soon as that's approved and we're really excited and thankful uh, for both institutions and we're excited to see um, that finalized curriculum packet. Student benefits, um, there are a lot of student benefits. Um, the first and most important um, is the reason why we're all gathered here today, and that is to provide BHAs with an elder, a mentor, a knowledge holder that can walk alongside them through this journey, provide those cultural ties, get them involved in the community, um, have a friend, a good relative, an extra layer of support for them. Um, so in this program, as we're recruiting students, we're also recruiting mentors. Um, to, to walk alongside with the BHAs um, and, and be that person for them if they need that. Um, they'll also have a deeper and more frequent relationship with the board. Um, they'll have the opportunity to eventually become a part of the BHA advisory work group, which kind of steers the development of the program. Um, they'll receive an electronic behavioral health aid model eventually later down the line, which will be a book, manual, um, that will help guide them through their curriculum and education journey. We're fully covering the cost of all school supplies. So we're providing students with a Dell laptop, a tablet, mouse, laptop covers, any other kind of school supplies, books, a tutor, if a student's falling behind, we're providing the support for all of that. We really wanna make sure that students aren't stressing out about finances. Um, we're also hoping to create um, in-person intensive, obviously that's really um, up in the air due to COVID, but we're working with um, two behavioral health um, departments to see um, if BHAs can come together as a cohort, meet one another, do that in-person learning, which will take place um, from one to two weeks. And we cover the cost of that travel. A large, um, Benefit, I would say, is a stipend slash scholarship that the board will be providing. Each student um, will receive $5,000 after their first completed um, level, BHA1, and then $7,500 after completing level two. Um, I say that it's a stipend slash scholarship because it's really dependent on the student situation. If a student has tuition coverage from their tribe, then they can use it as a stipend for their own personal expenses or a scholarship. If they don't have uh, financial support for tuition, then the board can cover their tuition costs. So we leave it open, um, whatever the student is needing. So what are the enrollment steps? What does that look like? Um, if you know someone or if you yourself are interested in the program, um, it's best to kind of reach out to your tribal health organization, get those um, conversations flowing, see if you have a clinical supervisor, um, if that is something that your tribe is needed. Like I said, we can kind of work to see if we can um, help assist with that. 
um, and see if it's a feasible for you for two years um, during your full-time or part-time work. Um, we also, like I said, um, are in the process of collaborating with tribes. This is a very new program. Um, so they're gonna have a lot of questions. Um, we're happy to kind of be that, that middleman, that middle person to help you start these conversations with your tribe, get them familiar with what, um, what it takes to implement a BHA in their department. Um, then you can decide if you wanna apply for the scholarship or stipend. Um, I kind of broke that down um, in the previous slide. A scholarship, the check will go directly to the academic institution that the student chooses. If the student prefers a stipend, the check will go directly to the student. Um, and then your last step is reaching out to me, myself, to schedule a one-on-one, -on -one, um, get that conversation flowing. We'll talk about past education experiences, go through that decision-making matrix, talk about work-related experience and um, your institution preference. Once the one-on-one's kind of been done, those decisions have been made, the application is ready to go, um, and then you submit it. Um, our team will be reviewing, um, kind of talking to uh, the tribe, clinical supervisors, and um, the application to the deadline to apply is October 30th. Um, so just about a month exactly from now. Um, we will be reviewing them and then contact applicants by December 1st to inform them um, if they were accepted the stipend or scholarship. Um, what are kind of the agreements um, or the needs, responsibilities if that um, student is awarded the scholarship stipend? Um, they'll have to commit to monthly check-ins with the clinical supervisor and myself, some members on my team. Um, they'll have to submit their grades, um, finding a mentor, elder, or support throughout the program. Um, student training agreement contract. This is a contract between the tribal health organization, the clinical supervisor, um, and our executive director, and of course, the student. Um, just making sure everyone is on the same page and is aware of what's going on. Um, a student responsibilities agreement form between the board and the student. And they'll also um, be required to attend gatherings like this, um, just to make sure that BHAs and their elders are getting all the updated information and also just create a community of support. So a big question is, is why? Why would I wanna be a BHA? Why as a tribal health organization do we wanna implement BHAs? Um, a, a first, large one is um, that this is this program is um, self-sovereign in uh, American Indian Alaska Native education. The Northwest is tailoring this education program based on the feedback and the needs from the tribes. We're leaving it open for tribes to decide what areas are really needed in their behavioral health department so they can really tailor it based on what they need. Um, they can be a part of the very first Northwest cohort to lead the way um, it's sometimes scary to be the first to do something, but that's also part of the, um, you'll become part of the very first development people. So the students, um, their feedback, their learning outcomes, their input and experiences throughout it, will be retaining that and tailoring it to um, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And I think a, a huge one for um, me personally, as someone who is a really large advocate for education in native country, um, is to inspire our future generations. Let's continue to build education for ourselves and each other and work through um, building that um, specific to the tribes, to our cultural needs, um, holistic care, trauma-informed, so that we can create systems of care for our tribal communities that um, that will lead the way. I mean, sorry, I just feel so passionate about it. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I mean, this why is a huge question, but um, I hope that throughout the presentation, you're able to kind of see why this would be a benefit for not only you, but your tribe. Um, and thank you to, to Carrie, my, our chapter director. This is a picture she provided.
Um, and then for ongoing updated information, you can visit our website. I update it pretty frequently. I'll most likely be adding this presentation to the website so that it's accessible and you can look back at it. Um, our website is tchpp.org. And I am um, running a little bit close, but I wanted to make sure that if anyone had questions, I will put my email and my phone number in the chat. Um, but now would be a great time if you have any specific questions um, about the institutions or the program itself, I'd be really happy to answer that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Awesome presentation. Great, Thank you, summary. Yeah. great summary, great visual. Thank I you. So Carrie, there's a question in the chat box. Are there certain states you are focusing on the recruitment of students? For this Northwest cohort, it is specific. Uh, the grant that is funding the scholarships and the stipends is for uh, the 43 tribes that the board serves. So Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, though eventually the program will be accessible to anyone. Um, once it's online for Heritage and um, Northwest Indian College, anyone can kind of go on and apply for this specific cohort, um, those three tribes. Wonderful. You've uh, actually got, you got some uh, kudos in here too. Uh, let me see, there is another question. Is BHA Service VA billable? Is it billable? That is something that our team is working through with um, American Indian Health Commission um, and another workforce group. We are hoping that eventually um, BHAs will be able to bill through Medicaid. Um, so that's something that our team is very aware of and wanna make sure that um, we're providing for BHAs. So at the moment we're working towards that. So Katie, we have a handful of, of uh, participants who are eagerly waiting to receive a copy of your PowerPoint. And so this is something that we'll be sharing with all of our participants today. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Katie for this presentation. This is my first time seeing this. I know that you uh, you updated it and it looks beautiful. I just love how it's interactive and um, so point on and um, it's great. You did an excellent job, Katie. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. What is the cost per student if tribes want to fund their students? The total cost is dependent on the chosen institution. Um, if you go to Heritage or Northwest Indian College website, they'll kind of have a breakdown of tuition college or tuition costs. But I also want to mention, and I left this out, that both um, institutions do provide really great scholarships um, and FAFSA. Um, so those costs even aren't the finalized cost because they provide that extra support. Um, so in all, I don't, I don't have a, a direct answer, um, but I can try to put some links in the chat that direct you to those um, program costs. Yes, Dr. Janice, you can respond. Um, since we have, uh, you know, many folks from uh, different um, tribal communities here, um, it's, I just wanna say, and I've mentioned this before, Katie, is that um, in higher education, in your respective higher education offices, you have adult vocational training uh, funds as that are available. And um, so those uh, communities that have interest in pursuing this, this is a certificate program. So you could potentially use adult AVT funds, adult vocational training funds, because that supports um, a non-degree student in a certificate program. And those are usually um, 
uh, you know, they pay for the tuition, they offer a stipend for books and things like that. So, you know, that's also something to really keep in mind um, when you're looking at maybe um, uh, someone from your community that wants to um, participate, say, in our heritage uh, uh, certificate program and or Northwest Indian College. I think Northwest Indian College is an associate program. Um, and they may still support that, but I'm not sure. I do know that uh, certificate programs are supported through the adult vocational training arm of higher education offices. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Janice, for answering that. Uh, I know that uh, Katie and our BHA team does host one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with folks who are interested and have more questions about the behavioral health aid program itself. And so for those who uh, want to have those uh, meetings scheduled with Katie, just uh, shoot us a text in the chat box or you can always email myself or Katie. We're always available and uh, willing to, uh, to schedule one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with you. Were there any questions from our participants or, you know, once again, you can just add that to the chat box. If there aren't any other questions, Katie, you did a great job once again. And as we move forward with the agenda, I know that Katie is going to introduce our new presenter. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, to transition us, Itai Jeffries um, lives in the Auburn, Washington, on the unceded land of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, but they grew up in rural North Carolina. I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so I will leave it to Itai. A large piece of their heart will always live in the land of the red dirt. Itai works with the Paths Remembered Project a two-spirit health equity and research initiative at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. When they aren't at work, you can find Itai out in their garden, harvesting wild medicines, laughing with family and friends, or eating good Southern food. Um, it's been really an honor sharing space with Itai this past year. I've been working for the board, so thank you, um, Itai, and I will hand it over to you. So much, Katie and Tanya. Danica, Sue, everybody. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance that uh, it's two o'clock and it's the time that my sister usually comes home. So her dogs are already barking for her in the background. So you'll just have to hear them because I don't know what to do about it. Um, but uh, uh, I just said, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Itai. I'm known in my language as the one who stands strong. I join you today from the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation of North Carolina, and we call ourselves the Yesa people in our language. I'm born of the white people and a child of our bear clan. Um, I also, I carry the, the privilege and the honor and the role um, of our third gender, uh, which we refer to as Nomba Mampi. Um, and so just coming here today, I'm joining again from Auburn, Washington. I'm very fortunate and grateful for the Muckleshoot people who have stewarded this place and to have relationships that I do have here um, and grateful to be a visitor here on this beautiful territory. Um, my people come from where the Roanoke and Dan Rivers converge um, originally in Southern Virginia. Uh, and today we, we live in Orange Alamance and Caswell counties of North Carolina, um, which is where all the different um, factors have landed my community today. Uh, but we know our territory is much larger. Um, the I-85 corridor through Southern Virginia and North Carolina was our Okanichi trading path. Um, so this is a story that many of us know in different contexts and different places. Um, and I will say as well that my English pronouns, as my language doesn't have pronouns, are they, them, and y'all. The y'all is important, as Aiden pointed out earlier, because I'm Southern and my people are located in North Carolina. So our version of, um, of Indian English is a Southern English. 
<laughs> but I am so grateful to um, be here today and to be asked to be part of this. And I was talking to um, Tanya and Katie ahead of this, and this is um, this event it, and the others that have preceded is about the the knowledge keepers and the wisdom keepers. Um, and there's so many elders in this space, and I recognize your names and have heard your names associated with so many different things. And I am, uh, I'm not an elder on this call and I'm taking this, this um, space today. I'm fortunate to have been asked and I also would like to ask that my words um, do no harm and that I come here with uh, really good intentions. Um, I don't consider myself to be any, any expert in nothing but my own story. So that's where I'm gonna start and talk from today is, um, is from my own story because I'm a learner and I'm learning a lot about this land up here that I share with you all in your territory. And it's, it's beautiful and I'm really grateful. So this um, being asked to be here today is a, it's powerful for me because I'm, I'm dealing with my own health challenges and everything. And so for, for my story to be asked to be in this space, it means a lot to me at this particular moment. So I just wanna thank you all and I feel comfortable in this space speaking to that. Um, and this is a story, while it is my story, it's a story about four elders, uh, two of whom are now ancestors. Um, and then one plant medicine that all four of, of those people and that plant medicine saved my life um, and helped me to understand that I belong here in this place, but also among my family and among my community and among my people. And that's where that story begins. And I had the real privilege that a lot of people don't have of getting to know my great, great grandmother um, as she was about seven when I passed on, I mean, when, when she passed on when I was a little kid. And one of my ways to remember early childhood memories is through smell and things like smells and tastes are the ways that we remember um, before we were, you know, talking a lot or really making our adult memories. And one of the things that I remember really distinctly is the smell inside of her house. And that's because it always smelled like the plant medicine, sassafras, which is a, a medicine we use back home. And my, my family uses it differently from the people further north. We use the root bark. People use different parts of it, but... Um, so it was her and then my dad who helped me to um, continue to identify and find that and work with that sassafras when I was a little kid. Um, and a little bit of context about growing up in the rural South where I come from. I came from rural Person County, um, which is mostly farmland. And I was pretty bullied at school. I knew that I knew that I was different, but I couldn't really understand what it was specifically that the other kids didn't like about me, but I was always hearing about it. Um, and I came to know more and more about what it was as, as I got older, but that bullying kind of made me want to be invisible, to not be seen. So by the time I'm a young adult and I decided to, to go to college, um, really something that my mom was very happy about. Uh, I had grown my hair over my, over one eye like this and figured that, you know, if I see less of people, they see less of me. <laughs> That's really how I moved through the world for a long time. And I wasn't exposed to that many elders um, from my tribe when I was a kid. And, and I really, I regret that, but I had no choice in that matter. And I somehow got so lucky to go to college at a place that has a relationship with my tribe, that was Gilbert College. And there were some elders, one, one of whom had um, gone to school as, a, as an adult, as a non-traditional student just before me, one that was going while I was there, and then four or five of my cousins who were going to school at the same time. And then my sister came and joined. Um, so we made up a good part of that, uh, the Native Student Association there. And one of the, that elder that was a non-traditional student there at the same time I was, I, I started a relationship with her. 
that would also come to change my life. And I'm, I'm putting a lot of different pieces in here because they're all going to come together in a minute. But she invited me um, as we kind of built this relationship to come and sit with a, a circle, a council of women. It was the Okanichi Traditional Health Circle. And it was a group of people talking about how to restore health in our community, but none of us were healthcare workers, right? We were all people who understood that, that health was, the root of it was understanding who we are. The root of it was in our language. The root of it was in how we see ourselves, whether or not we value ourselves enough to even go to the doctor was a question, right? And I learned so much from these women. And there was a day where I was sitting and we had to decide something. We'd actually put together a, a tribal health census and there was a decision that need, needed to be made about it before it got sent out. And I turned and I said, um, if I need to leave this space so that you all can vote on this or make this decision, I'll do that. And Rose Clay, which is one of the elders that I mentioned at the beginning, she turned to look at me and said, why? And I said, because this is a women's group, all of you are women. So if I need to you know, let you all make that decision, I'm happy to get up, right? She said, you're two spirit and you belong here. It was the first time I ever heard that. And it was only really about a year ago that I circled back up to Rose Clay and I told her, I said, you know, that was one of the moments that saved my life. And I don't know if I tell you enough, but I love you. And I, I'm so grateful for that. And to the auntie who invited me into that circle because she saw something. And that something set my whole trajectory of work and why I do research in health today and why I care so much about that intersection between health and culture. So when I think about... Um, these elders, one of them shared with me something after I heard about Two Spirit, I got real curious because I thought, huh, like, what is this? I, I'd come out, I'd identified as gay at first because that was the only language I had. And then I went to interact with that community and I'm like, okay, this is fun, but I don't know. I don't know. Like this is, I still felt like I was a visitor somewhere else. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't fully wrap my head around that. It still didn't feel like home, right? And I, I toyed with a lot of different ways to identify myself over time, but I was still trying to figure out what was this two-spirit? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for my people? And one of them shared with me, well, you know, our sassafras medicine tells us everything we need to know about that because she is our, our, one of our oldest medicines and our teachers, and she represents our village. And I was, I was so taken aback because that is the thing that reminded me of my great grandma, the thing that my dad and I did together. I never thought nothing about it other than I really liked it. I love the smell. I love the taste. I was always attracted to it. And then she said, have you ever noticed that that tree has three different leaves on the same tree? And I hadn't thought about it, but I know now there's a picture of it behind me, but there's a leaf like this. And she told me that represents the women. This one represents the men. And then there's a three lobe leaf that represented me, that represented us, that we had three genders in my tribe and everything started to click. And I realized that it wasn't just these women, it was that that medicine had been saving my life all along. And when I think about elders, when I close my eyes at night and I think about them, I think about each one of those people that I mentioned. But I've also met one of your all's tribal members very recently who is a nine-year-old elder because we all are elders to each other in different ways. And there's a nine-year-old Klamath person who is the, the child of one of my friends who has a completely different relationship with their childhood and lives so much in this gender balanced place, will wear a dress one day and then is out you know, being rugged in the blue jeans, shirt off the next day and just blows my mind. And I've been looking at the young people who are telling us something because they're both growing up in a different world than I had, than you had, than people before us had, but they're also creating one. And this little person 
has given me the bravery to talk more about my story. And so that story about the Sassafras now has been turned into a children's book through Northwest Portland. I can put a link at the end if any of you are interested in having that for, our, for your programs, for your family, for your relatives, friends. Um, and it was with that elder's permission and she's the first author and I'm the second author on that, um, on that because she, when I asked her for permission to do that, she said, it's your story too. So we put that out there. Um, but through the research that we're doing at Paz Remembered, um, I have come to understand a few things and we've only done a few data sets so far. It's a new program. One of the things that we learned though in 2020 was that 86% of our two-spirit community that was involved in that survey has experienced suicidality. 86%, I can relate. But one of the one of the most amazing things is that 94% of the people who took that survey say that their indigeneity is extremely important to them. But we also hear these stories and it was captured in the research that people feel the need to abandon their families or feel abandoned by their families. They feel the need to leave their community or that, that they've been left by their community. This isn't true everywhere or for everybody, but it is something that is being seen and being felt. And I think about that nine-year-old and what my responsibility is to tell my story. And I also think about the responsibilities that all of us have to create something different, to see all of our relatives. So where I'm gonna land on this um, today, because there's so many different places we could go with this, but one of the things that, um, there was a study in 2018 that showed that this one simple thing reduces suicidality by 54%. And that was learning to use people's chosen names and to refer to them using the pronouns that they feel reflect their gender, that we can reduce suicidality by 54% just by doing that. And the reason I share that in that way is when I first really understood that when I heard people say he, pronouns for me that it's like a foghorn going, went off and I kind of lost track of what was being said and I felt myself leaving the conversation. When I realized that about myself, I still hesitated to ask loved ones, especially people who are older than me, to do that for me. I felt like it, was, it wasn't respectful um, to ask that because I didn't feel like I could take up that space or to, to ask something that felt like they would have to change or may have to work on the way that they talk. But I came to a different conclusion because I've really uh, been sitting with the words of LaDonna Harris, a, you know, a Comanche grandmother who wrote about the four R's of indigeneity and reciprocity is really one of them. And, and I wanna sit and be respectful. And, and I just know that that is such a reciprocal thing and that we all teach one another something. And so I'm allowing myself to have that conversation with people. And I'm trying to have that conversation with people so that that nine-year-old doesn't have to have that conversation with as many people. And it's not the first time that they heard it when I share it. So, and I know time is dwindling down, you know, I might have some questions, but two things that dawned on me about that, um, gender pronouns um, that, well, it, first of all, of all the things that, that can contribute to suicidality in our communities, so many of them are so hard to remedy or take so long or are so complicated. Gender pronouns is not one of those, right? I love an easy win or a quick win. I do, I celebrate that. And so to think that that is something that we can all do gives me a lot of joy. And I thought about it in terms of, you know, the fact that my language and many of our languages don't have um, gender pronouns in them. In my language, if you say that person, Yalewa, that person walks, that person is walking. It doesn't say he's walking or she's walking. Um, and when I think about uh, the importance that we have placed since time immemorial on naming people, that means that the way that you refer to somebody is really important. And we didn't ask to be here speaking English, but we, the reality is we are speaking English. And so since we have to do that to communicate with one another, we can adapt it to be more closer to what our tribal languages were. And so that is one thing that I think a lot about um, as well, is that 
there are ways to do English better because the answers to this predicament, the answers to the feelings that especially young two-spirit, but even two-spirit elders are having today, some people see that as an answer that comes from outside of our communities, but the answers always come from inside. Because for thousands of years, we saw, acknowledged, honored, sometimes revered two-spirit people. And we have always cared a lot about how we refer to one another. So I think it's just a returning to, and that's why we named this the Paths Remembering Project, because we're going to remember, to remember the paths that our two-spirit ancestors walked and that our communities walked to hold us in the light. So thank you all for listening to the story that I had to share today. And I just wanna, um, I wanted to leave some space. Space is hard to get in our meetings these days, but we got about 10 minutes too, just to create some space if anybody has anything that you're thinking about, if you wanna share or a question again. I, I'll say something. Um, hi, my name is Zaki Smalley, Kiaani Nishlantra, and Dickie Nabasinski. Last year, that's my from the evening yesterday. Um, the I am Navajo. I'm grateful for your words and um, sharing your story. Um, it came being, I mean, like I lost my um, cousin um, two years ago, and there's two spirits. And um, I have a story with that, but um, I just want to share that um, I acknowledge your presence. Thank you for um, your story. It um, resonated with me today. Um, I needed that. Thank you. Good medicine. This is Cassie. Am I able to make a comment? Of course, thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to um, tell you, my, name, um, my given name is Cassandra Sellers-Rick. I come um, from the Mount Smith Cloud family and I'm a Kellett's tribal member and I live in Battleground, Washington. And today's my um, first day off, kind of, um, in that I had a class in the morning and now I have this. And um, I just really wanted to thank you um, as a tribal leader on the health board, our health board chair and on tribal council. And, um, but by trade, I'm um, a neurotrauma ICU ECMO nurse working in the biohazard ICU. And um, as a tribal leader and thinking that youth are really important and our tribe um, is a dispersed tribe and um, not having any money, but not wanting to care that we didn't have money because we knew that our kids needed a safe place. I just really... Um, We've worked and worked with our kids and now we're having these um, safe places. And your um, story today really um, connected with me for the fact that we had a COVID safe culture camp this um, summer. And I, um, right, I right. felt, I guess, disconnected to the fact that um, I didn't understand the 
meaning behind the pronouns and the importance. And I think that's really important. It's important for us as tribal leaders. I never disrespected it because I work um, in the ER in inner city Portland and we have um, a big, beautiful community of two spirit and all different types of diversity. And that's why um, I travel over an hour to go to that job is because it meets my own personal mission and vision. But this conversation is really important. Because even in my ER work, we're starting to be so much more sensitive and want to be sensitive and respectful. But hearing the link between suicidality and pronoun is really imp a really important piece for me today. And I want to share with you that I promise you that I will use your words and I will share that so that I can do my part as an ally. And just somebody who um, loves people and really appreciates um, yeah, learning so and hearing well, and wanting to be more sensitive and more kind and loving. And so I just wanted to share that with you that I really appreciate what you brought. Um, we have a, um, a presenter here that's gonna come up, Marilyn Scott, who is one of those elders that I continually look up to in our area. And um, she walks her walk and talks her talk and teaches me um, about the love and how our tribes are so much better together. And so I just wanna thank you for what you've um, done today and where you've shared. And um, thank you for choosing to stay on this side and choosing the path that you're taking because you're making a huge yeah. difference. So thank you. Thank you for sharing, Cassie. Uh, Loda, I'd like to piggyback onto that because Cassie took the words out of my mouth. Um, my, do my child um, has asked me to call them, they, them, and by a different name. And um, in my teenage years I went by my middle name for a little while and I thought it was a phase thing you know and so um, I had named her after a medicine woman of our tribe that um, probably the first woman to I the first person in our tribe to look into my eyes and tell me that I was native um, and know my heart and know my way so when my child wants to change their name from that very per you know she goes that name is dead to me and I'm like what no, no, you know, it's, it's been traumatic, but being part of that camp that um, Kathy told, uh, spoke of was, it was powerful because um, being a parent of a two-spirit um, has been really um, beautiful and wonderful, And but there's watching them come out to certain groups, so certain groups I, I could say they, them, other groups I had to say she, some groups I could use her, her name, other uh, dead name versus a live name and all these things. And so being able to see our children at that camp that she spoke of, and not only our children, but our adult two spirits who helped mentor some conversations at that camp um, that had helped me as a parent of a two spirit. And now I really am trying to find, you know, tools to solidify and help me not use um, now that we can fully use they, them, and use the names she pre that they prefer to be called, um, I was like, what can solidify this for me? What can really just make it sink in so I will change and I can't, I won't go back? And being a past paramedic and hearing you talk about the suicidality and like Cassie spoke of, um, I needed that. I needed to hear that. I needed to hear those stats. I needed to hear that 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 that's going to be the cementing factor for me to be able to really really um empower my child and um really uh, validate their pronouns and validate that name choice that they've chosen now um and and it's not about me anymore you know it's not about my elder's name it's not <laughs> it's about that so thank you so much for sharing that story um um, I'm glad Cass Cassie spoke because that 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 camp was an amazing camp for all that we've been through with COVID to see our children and to see that education of other children and adults 
and to see our two spirits that have been hiding in the shadows be able to be those mentors for our children, it was a powerful and amazing event. And so thank you for your words and thank you for your story. Thank you for telling your story. Um, and uh, you honor us by sharing those, those words. You honor us. And I hold my hands up to you. And um, uh, uh, it's powerful. I'm, you know, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of you who um, had comments. Uh, that means a lot. I'm reading the chat. Um, that all of it means a lot to me. And one thing I'll say, because I know we're out of time, about the uh, learning to do it, where it kind of sinks in. I always tell people, because I had to learn it too. I mean, you know, I wasn't raised with that. I didn't even know gender neutral pronouns till I was 29. But um, I always try to find somebody I can practice conversation and I'll pick somebody. I always tell people, pick somebody to talk about. And if they need to talk about me, they can talk about me. Like, oh yeah, Itai came over the other day and they had, you know, they had spaghetti for, for dinner and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I tell people just to practice talking. And one other thing is that when you are um, talking with your partner or your sister and other people, don't revert back to what you think that person understands because the, the having to switch all the time can confuse you. So if it means having a conversation with your sister so that she understands why you're using they, then just try that um, because it takes, it does take practice, but you know what also took practice? I didn't learn my tribal language until I was 19, right? And it took a lot of, and it still takes practice. So everything and everything worth having takes practice. And I, I really, I hold my hands up to you for committing to that for, um, for your uh, loved one and child too. So thank you all so much. I'm going to pass it over to, for the next presenter. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the person uh, who's on there on the video, Jay Ortiz. But I just wanted to say the, the elder who taught me the Sassafras story, you look just like her. So you look like my auntie and you were giving me these head nods. And so I was feeling stronger and stronger as I was talking. So just thank you as well. Okay. Thank you so much again, Itai. I just feel very emotional in general and just good tears and also some, um, you know, some tears that just need to come out and share that space. And I feel comfortable with all of you. And um, before we take a, a break, a 10 minute break, just reflecting on, on pronouns and your story and, um, uh, one of the general orientation courses for behavioral health aids, Danica, is um, touching on subjects for two-spirit pronouns for BHAs because, um, you know, they'll be working in health departments. Um, like you said, Itai, sometimes it's even scary going into a health department, open yourself up and, and seek that help. And having in uh, pronouns on an intake form, you know, that can make that person feel even more welcome and invited and seen and heard. Um, so this, these are the things that our team is um, definitely talking through with the curriculum builders. And, you know, we hope to, to share space that, that acknowledges that presence and those pronouns and those stories. So um, thank you so much for all the work that you do. And we're so excited to, to read that Path Remembered book. Um, I think Itai put that in that link in the chat as well. Um, but we're going to transition now into a break. Um, so at 2.40, um, we'll, we'll come back and Marilyn Scott will be um, doing a tribal leadership career perspective. So uh, we will meet back at 2.40. Thank you, thank you.
Welcome back, folks. Hope that you were able to uh, get up and do a quick stretch or grab another cup of coffee or tea. Definitely drinking water. As we um, transition back into our agenda, I wanted to share our next presenter. We're very proud and honored to have Marilyn Scott joining us today. Marilyn is a member of the Upper Skagit Tribe and she's currently serves as Vice Chairwoman. She's been an elected official for more than 30 years and she partners with many boards and many advisory groups. She participates and advocates to improve tribal healthcare delivery systems to meet the needs of red tribal communities on a local, regional, and state level. She knows the value of utilizing the teachings and stories of her ancestors, and she's always willing to share that knowledge. And she's also a valued member of the Portland Area Behavioral Health Aid Advisory Work Group. Please welcome Marilyn Scott. Thank you so much, Tanya, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so happy to join the group today. I wanted to just uh, introduce myself for those of you that have not had the chance to uh, work beside me or meet me in the various venues that I have worked over the years. My name is Marilyn Scott, and I have uh, my family given name is Wichelitsa. And I uh, was born and raised on the Lummi Reservation, but I had uh, uh, descendancy and was eligible to become enrolled with the Upper Skagit tribe from my uh, great grandfather's family line. And so when I uh, uh, married and moved to the Skagit County area, I became enrolled with the Upper Skagit tribe and have served on the Upper Skagit Tribal Council for more than 30 years. In uh, the many terms of office is the work that I do is for the people of all Indian country. And, uh, you know, I, my story starts from when my um, grandmother, my mother, um, when I was born, my mother asked my grandparents if they would be willing to take me and raise me because she felt she was young. She did not feel she could raise me. So she asked my grandparents if they would raise me. So I, uh, from the time of birth, I lived with my grandparents on the Lummi Reservation and was raised there with my grandparents. My mother, uh, had lived at uh, on the Swinomish Reservation and was married there. Um, and have I have siblings that uh, grew up on the Swinomish Reservation. So I have uh, family ties in all the local tribes of the Northwest uh, part of the state of Washington. All of my relatives are, are living and uh, were raised in the reservations within the Swinomish and the Lummi, the Nooksack and Upper Skagit. So I have family ties in all of the tribes in the local area that uh, many of my relatives uh, have been a part of the work that I have helped uh, serve. And so I have was uh, uh, very surprised to hear when uh, the preparation for today's gathering that some of the behavioral health aid students that are working currently, the trainees, were asking for um, 
representatives of tribal leadership to uh, uh, share information uh, about our work from the tribal leader perspective with the behavioral health aides. And so I um, uh, thought about it and, and I said, well, it's, it's always good to share your story so that it, it provides the incentive for our uh, future generations and our people to work for our own people. Many times we may uh, go away, get our education and then get caught up in that outside world and we don't come home and uh, share our work and our education with our own people. And that's one of the things that was taught to me by my grandparents was that no matter what you do, you can choose to be whoever and whatever you want to be, but whatever you do, you serve your people, all of Indian country, and you cannot be selfish. You cannot just serve your own tribal people, your own family, you must serve all Indian people. And so that's a teaching that I was taught when I was growing up. And so it's always in the back of my mind when I um, uh, looked at what my future was going to be. But I can relate to the, to the definition of uh, the sharing of the previous speaker, sharing that uh, we're all elders. And there's a nine-year-old elder that he talked about. Um, and I, I just relate to that because we we're not uh, given and we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And many times, our children are the carriers of the songs, the traditions, and the beliefs of our families that we rely upon to carry forward um, within our communities the teachings that have been shared by their ancestors, by our ancestors. And it's continuing to pass down those teachings that we do the work that we do every day. And I, I truly admire, and I had so many mentors when I was beginning at a young age, um, the, my role and determining what my future role was going to be within my own family, within my own community. And at that time, I had, uh, I had dropped out of high school uh, and I had uh, moved away from home, my home at Lummi. And then I uh, determined that I was not gonna be able to survive with uh, not finishing school. And so I went back to school and uh, finished my high school uh, diploma and then move forward from there. At that time, many of the, the elders that were my mentors, they would advise me, we need more of our people to, to go into the health careers. And I was not interested in, in uh, working in the health career field at the time, but it, it's one of those things when your elders tell you something, sometimes you don't have a choice in what you are going to do. And many of the elders, they, they guide you in the way that they feel that you should go. And that at times they will uh, share with you stories of others in the family that have taken on various roles. So from the tribal perspective, my role has been uh, served in many ways. I've had many mentors in my early uh, years of career. Uh, I had uh, elders from the Lummi Nation that knew me from the time I grew up. I had elders from Swinomish that 
I worked with when I was still in high school uh, that guided me in a, in a way that was given me the direction of what my future would be. And never in all of those early years did I believe that I was uh, going to be working as a elected tribal leader of the tribe uh, at all. And uh, in the beginning, one of the one of my um, elder tribal member uh, council members at the time that I uh, was working under, because I started in my early career working in the Upper Skagit Tribal Health Clinic. I worked as the receptionist, that's where I started. But it was with the work that I had also experienced when I was still in high school, the summer programs, the at the um, supervisors that I had, and one of those supervisors was Juanita Jefferson, an elder from Lummi Nation. She was my supervisor and she was uh, one that guided me in learning a lot of things that would give me some tools to work into the future. Another elder that helped uh, advise me was Violet Hilaire who was a community advocate from the Lummi Nation. She was not an elected official, but she was truly the backbone for her family and the community. She was a community advocate and that's the role that she served. And she uh, attended meetings uh, with her and it, and it was like she took me under, my, under her wing and she, uh, uh, introduced me to people I needed to know and do many things and learned a lot more about the, the health needs of our people. And so many of the, the elders that I worked with, uh, Laura Wilbur, she was one of the very first uh, tribal health board members of the Northwest Tribal Health Board in the beginning years when the tribes only had CHRs and funding, very minimal Indian Health Service funding. And uh, Laura Wilbur was another one of the elders that mentored me when I was working at Swinomish in their fish plant at the time. And I was working there in the, uh, taking orders and answering the phone at the time, but I got to got to work with the many of the tribal leaders and elders of, of the tribes in the local area here. And it, with that experience, I, I uh, was shared many tools and given many tools that helped guide me in my own career. So with that, I just hope that uh, there's incentive for the role of each and every one and the teachings that many of your ancestors have shared with you, it's important for us to keep those teachings, those traditions and those cultures moving into the future. And we all know that uh, many of our young adults seem to uh, at times we feel like they're not listening and they are not wanting to hear some of the old ways and traditions and cultures. But after a certain point in their life, in, in my own experience, my grandmother, the teachings and stories she told me, I might not have been listening closely at the time when she was telling them to me, but later on in life, those stories uh, were some of the tools that I used in my own life, in my own career. The, some of those stories and traditions and, and ways of life is how I survived in my early young years when the economy was very poor. The families are many of our households. You know, I grew up on the Lummi Reservation and it happened to be a part of the reservation that was not developed 
And we did not have running water. We did not have electricity. We did not have the paved roads where we lived. So we lived in a very humble one uh, room home at, when I was small growing up. And so I always shared the story of I, I, my life began in a very humble way in a very humble place. And I don't never take anything for granted. There's things that happen for a reason. And sometimes we don't know what that reason is, but the, that experience helps us in our own future and helps us guide our own uh, young people into the future. When they need, need something, we can be there to share with them. So I just wanted to share, uh, you know, I have worked, uh, I, when I first ran for council, the uh, council member that convinced me to sign up to run for council, I, I was not interested at the time. I was very young and I, I said, no, I cannot do that. I'm not gonna be out there in the public. and. They said, you remember what your grandparents said. You can do whatever you want to do, but make sure you do it for all Indian people. You need to remember that teaching. And so, you know, I thought about it. And so I signed up, not thinking that I would ever get elected. But when I, when the elections came around, I was elected by one vote, by one, the election by one vote. And so that's another teaching. When it's time to vote, every vote counts. I remember every time I was elected by one vote. And we have had a consistent tribal government and tribal council. We have lost, uh, you know, for the term of office that I have served on my tribal council for the 30 years that I've served, we have had minimal change. We have had consistency within our tribal government and it keep, continues to help us to be sustaining in our future and the development uh, when we have consistency within our community. But I always say when I was elected, you know, I have served uh, on the tribal council in the beginning uh, in the learning stage, we were just developing our reservation and the codes for our uh, reservation at the time. And this was in 1980. And at, when we were developing the codes for the, the uh, development of our, our water, codes, our law and order codes, all of those things. That was a big learning time for me. I served, you know, we, we worked till late hours in the night working on those codes um, and the development. So I've seen a lot of change within my small community over the years, but have been a part of that. But one thing I want to share is that it's important for the elected leadership to work for the people. We work for the people and listen to the people. And I always say my door is never closed. My door is open. Anybody has something to talk to me about or ask me questions, my door is always open. And that has been very helpful in um, continuing to know what the needs of our people are. And uh, it must make a difference because each reelection time I've been reelected uh, and many terms I've had um, individuals that have run against me, uh, but also I've had uh, terms where there was no, um, none of our membership signed up against me. So I was reelected by acclamation. 
So it, it makes a difference on the way you do your job as a tribal leader and listening to the people. But it's important to keep in mind the importance of your traditions and your culture. When we're uh, working with the state or the federal government, if we don't share our ways with those outsiders that make decisions for us, there we're not doing our people any better if we're not sharing our own way of life. We know best what our people need and we have to go out there and work with those state and federal uh, representatives to share what those needs are. Listen to our people, take those needs forward and, and bring it to those decision makers, the congressional representatives. And when we do that, it makes a difference. It doesn't always cover all the federal obligation. We're always saying that we're a sovereign nation, but we don't always get listened to what our priorities are. And each tribe is very different. We're all different in how we do things and the way things are done and how we, uh, what are the needs of our communities are. But we should know our own people and the leadership should listen to our own people so that we're providing the services that our people need, not what somebody else believes that we need. And we have to break those barriers and those myths that, you know, all Indian people gets everything free from the federal government. We all know that's not true. Those of us in Indian country, we have to work very hard to get the few things that we are able to get from the federal government um, to pay back for all of the lands that we uh, uh, seeded for the federal government to uh, develop the country. So I share the, the perspective of the traditions and the importance of the cultural and the knowledge keepers. Every one of you have some of that knowledge and perspective that you can share within your families, within your community. And we all have differences in religion, in the ways and traditions that we live, the foods that we eat, we're all different. But at the same time, we all uh, can share those things with our future. And I always say that the future generation is going to follow after those that they have been taught by. And that's what the teaching has been over and over again. And although at times we feel our young adults don't want to listen, they don't want to hear what we have to say, I always say, share the story anyway. And in, eventually that story will be passed on to uh, someone that wants to listen. It's important for us to, to do that. And I'm, I'm so excited about the Behavioral Health Aid Program. I've uh, worked in the state of Washington for <clears throat> more than 20 years, attempting to improve access to behavioral health for Indian people. We have had lack of access to help and meet the needs of our Indian people in mental health, and chemical dependency for many years in the state of Washington, we have managed care. We have all of those organizations that are set up to provide access to mental health and chemical dependency services to all the citizens within the state. But many of our people, we can't get them to those in those doors of those places. And we, at times, we have uh, fought many times to get the governor, to get the, the administrators, the cabinet of the governor, to listen to the tribal leaders within the state, uh, help us get access to the needs of our people. 
our people are dying before we can get them into the detox centers, before we can get them the mental health help that they might need. Uh, we have the, the suicide rate within our communities is, is higher than any other race, but we still have limited access to behavioral health. So that's what is the important reason why I have joined the work of the development of the community health aid program and the behavioral health aid so that we can train our own people. Our own people know how to lead our people that have need for those services, behavioral health services. We know how to help them, whether it's helping them go see the traditional healers, whether it's bringing them to the longhouse, whether it's uh, just bringing them to somebody to pray for them, helping them get the, the needs of what is hurting them spiritually, we can help them. Our people can help our own. It's not that outsider that's got that PhD degree that doesn't know anything about our community, our traditions, our culture. They're not gonna be the ones that's gonna help our people heal. It's our own people that's gonna help our community members heal. I have a, a, a recording and it's, it's still in the works, but I wanted to um, share this video. It's a 13 minute video. I started uh, recording um, uh, my story about tribal leadership in the terms that I have served my tribe in. So I wanted to share that today. Hi, Marilyn. Can you see the uh, my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. We're not hearing the sound, Tanya. Okay. I was born and raised on the Lummi Reservation, uh, born in Fort Bellingham, and given name is Wichelitsa. I originally was born and raised on the Lummi Reservation, uh, born in Fort Bellingham, and uh, raised by my grandparents right from birth. My mother felt she could not uh, take care of me and asked my grandparents if they would take care of me and raise me. Even many of our own people don't recognize the impact of historical trauma. You know, we've all heard the stories about the impact of the boarding schools and what happened to our ancestors, you know, our elders from generations before, uh, how they were taken away from their families and placed in boarding schools. And, different names in some cases and not allowed to practice the cultural traditions and or speak the traditional language. Well, 
even my generation. You know, we didn't really seem to understand the impact of some of that trauma that happened to some of our ancestors. There was reasons for now that we're learning that uh, many of those grandparents and parents, they lacked the parenting skills when they were in the boarding schools, when they were taken away from their families and, and they lived in the, the, uh, the uh, dorms and, you know, they didn't have contact with their families. at Lummi and born and raised there and we lived in a, a very humble two-room house on Scott Road originally that was the house that we lived in when we were small. We had um, kerosene lamps and uh, lanterns, gas lanterns is what we used for light in the you know when we do work on our homework and things. We would have to go to the old gym where the college is now to get the water. Uh, we would have to haul the water to our house. It was like a, a big family for the people that uh, lived within the reservation when I was growing up. You know, we all start from somewhere. I mean, I started from the very beginning. I was lucky enough to be able to work in the after school. I don't know what they called it then, but uh, it was like the Opportunity Council. I would get off the bus there and answer the phones. Yeah, yeah. So that was like in 1975. I completed high school and then I moved in, and married in uh, and was eligible to be enrolled at Upper Skagit. So I um, relinquished my enrollment at Lummi and enrolled at the Upper Skagit tribe. They had a, a position as the administrative manager for the health clinic. Maureen was the general manager for the tribe at the time, and she moved me into the, the uh, health clinic to uh, manage the business office for the health clinic. Then she asked me if I would be willing to travel with her to go to some of the meetings, and that was when the Northwest Portland Area Health Board was just forming during the, that time. Yeah. And she said, well, now we got a, one more step, and that's for you to get on the tribal council. I said, no, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> and she kept saying that to me, and I was young and I didn't really know, I didn't really have an interest in it at the mm -hmm. time. She said, you're enrolled here now. If you really want to make a difference, you got to uh, serve on the tribal council. And, uh, you know, I had told her the story about my grandmother when I was growing up, when I was starting high school, she said, you can be whatever you want to be. You have to remember that you're not only going to be working for yourself and your family, you work for all Indian people. So she kind of tricked me. She said, well, I want you to remember what your grandmother told you. This is just another step in, in growing up.
I ended up winning the election by one vote. Yeah. One vote. One vote makes a difference. Yeah. So, so I was a part of the development of this community yeah. because I was elected on the council right at 1980. It was overwhelming for me because I, I really didn't know what I was in for. I was able to then bring to the forefront other health and social service issues uh, to the tribal government and not have only the highest priority be the natural resources. It took me some time to learn how to navigate the channels that we needed to go through to get change. You know, I've worked in the health field pretty much my whole uh, term. One of the things that I'm most proud of, and it's just been recent in the last five years, when Governor Inslee was elected, he re-established the public health, foundational public health, and what was it that the state was uh, financially obligated to provide across the all of the counties for all the citizens in the state. And they had not considered tribal governments as being a sovereign within the state at the time. And he had not had that experience. Many of the departments that had responsibility for policy decisions with healthcare access didn't even realize that for every federal dollar that comes into the state, the state has an obligation to the tribal governments in Washington. But he reached out to the tribes and asked the tribes if there was a tribal leader that was willing to serve on his um, executive advisory council for the establishment of the state public health foundational. And so then I became his co-chair for the statewide with uh, mayors and county commissioners across the state from the various counties on his advisory Did committee. you find that they knew anything about Indians? Or no, they, they did not know nothing. So you had to start over again. And they, they, some of them were interested in knowing more about it. They just didn't know how to ask questions. Yeah. And they were very grateful for the information that right from the get-go, I mean, I wasn't going to let them get away with nothing. We have always looked at the whole person. That's the difference between tribal people and non-tribal people. The well-being of our spiritual and our physical and our mental health, it's all a part of the person. We're not well within our mind. It can impact our physical health. The Medicine Wheel Circle is the way of life that the tribal people have always lived. We have to be well completely in order to survive. Being humble. The title of tribal council, tribal chairman, tribal vice chairman, that it doesn't change me as a person. I'm still your auntie, your grandmother, your, your neighbor. And my door is always open and I don't consider myself being above anyone. What I've learned over many years of work now is that one person can't do it all. You have to team up with others that have similar issues, concerns, or problems. Personally, my strength is my spiritual life. I practice with the winter smokehouse. I take time off during the winter months to participate in that activity, and that's when I travel around and participate with all of the other uh, tribes. And, uh, you know, it's like learning and listening to the stories that 
re it re-energizes me. I I remember growing up many of the the elders at the time uh, would gather at the old smokehouse down by the river. And that was a time when the kids, you know, we as kids at the time, uh, we were put in a, a corner and told to be quiet and listen and you don't move, you know. That was just the way it was. And, it, you know, it didn't matter. The elders would tell kids at that time, if you were not being quiet and not listening, you were scolded in front of everybody. You can be whatever you want to be, you know. It, um, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You can be whatever you want to be, but all I want you to remember is that whatever it is that you do, you think about not just yourself, your immediate family, but you think about all Indian people. Thank you, Tanya, for starting that. And I just wanted to share with the group that um, the the video is is still in the work, so it's like a preview of of the uh, story that I'm developing for the young adults that I'm hoping that will come up after I'm done working with the tribal government and move on into the future. Uh, one thing I want to share is that when working for the tribal government, much of the time that you sat, the, the family sacrifices, you know, I have to commend my family for allowing me for the years that I have served to travel to uh, the national uh, committees and meetings to represent the region as well as the tribes. Uh, and the amount of work and time away from home, it does take a, a toll on the family. Uh, but uh, family is so important for all of us to remember. That's the reason why we do the work that we do and all of our people. So with that, I just want to say hi, scrub my head. Thank you so, so much, Marilyn, for sharing your story. And that video is absolutely beautiful. I wanted to keep this space open to see if anyone had any comments or questions for Marilyn. Hi, Katie. This is Libby Watanabe with the Snoqualmie tribe. I just want to really thank uh, you and Tanya for making the time and space for Marilyn to share her story of her personal story of leadership, perseverance, and um, dedication to tribal people. I think the video was absolutely beautiful. And uh, I look forward to seeing when that is published. And I just know that um, Councilwoman Scott always dedicates herself fully to a lot of different causes and has this wisdom and energy that's really infectious. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tanya, one other thing that I 
wanted to share is that um, many of our tribal leaders uh, within the Northwest, as well as across the country, we rely upon each other to take uh, priority uh, areas of work. Uh, and I mentioned in the video, one person can't do it all. Um, and, and so one of the things that has happened, and that's the reason why, you know, we are beginning to, we uh, lose some of our uh, leadership that we rely upon for various areas. Um, you know, we just recently lost our uh, tribal elder from Swinomish that had served on the Northwest Fisheries Commission uh, for more than 40 years. And, uh, you know, it's a void now. And so it's one of those things that happens and that, you know, we're not gonna be here forever. And it's the work that we do and the work that we share uh, with others that keeps things going. And family is so important, but I, my family have been so supportive. My community has been so supportive of the continued work uh, on behalf of our people. Um, and it's not only myself, but other tribes and tribal leaders from other tribes that work together. You know, uh, Ron Allen from Jamestown, uh, you know, many tribal leaders now, we have Vaughn Sharp as the president of uh, National Congress of American Indians. You know, Brian Clattisby had served the National Congress. We just had elections today for the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians and Leonard Forsman has been reelected as our president for the AT&I. Uh, it's the work that we all do together and uh, many times the, the, the state and the federal officials, they want the tribes to pit each other against each other. But when we work together, the tribes, we can get a lot farther uh, in the work that we need to get done. And there's, it's an ongoing effort that it takes. And I'm very, uh, uh, fortunate and happy that we have some new young leadership that is beginning to learn and stepping up to those, the work that needs to go on at the national and the federal and the state level. Uh, I'm so proud of them and, and many of them are just stepping right in there and uh, moving forward. So thank you so much for taking the time out to listen to the leadership perspective today, Heishka. I think uh, Itai said it most wonderful that uh, it was such a gift that you shared with us. And uh, there are so many thank yous in the chat box for you that I will definitely be sharing that with you. Um, as we come to a close, but uh, you spot on, Itayi, truly a gift. Thank you. as we let her teachings kind of resonate in our ears and our hearts and in our memories. I um, just wanted to take a, a moment of a breath. That was so good. So good for the heart and so good for the soul. So thank you. <clears throat> as we come back into our agenda, we have a really fun activity that Katie is hosting with us today. And uh, the floor is yours, Katie. Right, everyone. 
There is a spinning wheel of names that I'm going to share my screen with. The person whose name gets called on will have to be present in order to win the raffle. If it is your name, if you could just unmute yourself and make yourself seen or heard or put it in the chat so Tanya can see, I am not able to see the chat. So with that being said, we're going to, to spin the wheel. Andrea, are you on? I don't see that she's on. Yeah, I don't see her either. We're going to do it again. We're going to keep spinning until we find someone who's who's online, so we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. We'll see, we'll leave it up in there. Priscilla, are you on? Well, I see her name, Katie. Priscilla, Priscilla Blackwolf. I don't see her now. <laughs> it's too much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be here and accounted for. What do you all think? Should we try to, should we keep spinning? All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Both yes. Saying yes. All right. Here we go. Frank, are you still on? I think Frank had to leave, but let me double check. I don't see him. Okay, we're gonna do it again. know if I've seen Shadi on. Are you out there? So we're gonna we're gonna keep on spinning. Yeah, I didn't see Shadi in there. <gasps> Amy. <laughs> Amy, are you on? I know she was earlier. She is. Amy, you're the winner. It was meant to be. Amy is a BHA student at Lorelwa. So definitely deserving of a lanyard. Here is your Mother Earth's Colors lanyard. It's got some turquoise on it. I have Amy's address, actually. So <laughs> I'll be mailing that off to you soon. Um, congrats, Amy. Um, thank you everyone for participating in that. I'll share my, um, my beading website in case anyone is interested in getting some bead work. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it over to Tanya again. As we come to a conclusion to today's event, I just wanted to leave it as an open floor. And um, if anyone has any thoughts, comments, feedback, or your time with us today, uh, let us know. You can also put it in the chat box too. You can also email me too.
I guess I'll say something. I was just, uh, everything I learned here uh, is pretty amazing uh, about, you know, being indigenous people and re-grasping. Uh, I hear the word, you know, throughout my career about multi-generational greatness over and over and over. I mean, multi-generational trauma, I'm sorry, over and over and over. And, uh, you know, there was a point in my career even where I got tired of hearing it. I think it's important to hear it and learn about it. But I think it's equally as important to hear and learn about multi-generational greatness, all of that stuff that is intrinsically, you know, built into us that has been passed down from, from our ancestors. And, and Marilyn, she, uh, she struck a chord in me really deep. Um, it's like hearing, my grandma just passed uh, last week. Um, and so hearing her, uh, it was really, like I said, she, 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 um, <laughs> I don't have any other words other than she hit the cord, the nail on the head or whatever. I, I have I'm, I'm devoid of words right now, but, um, what I wanted to say is the, the message that she was talking about, <clears throat> um, you see so much in this world about division of each other, especially when it comes to indigenous people. It, I, I've been working with youth my whole career, and there's always something that makes us different or divides us or separates us, and I get so frustrating, and especially um, being a person, an Indigenous person of mixed blood, it's so important to come together no matter where you are. I've spent my whole career in everybody else's home helping, and um, so her message of doing that, of, of you know, giving yourself no matter where you're at was really important. I just hope that that resonate, it resonates with me for sure, but I hope it's something that we can grasp more tightly on in a world that is struggling so bad with me, 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 me versus the collective. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, Tanya, this is Marilyn again. I just wanted to um, uh, share with the group uh, the the hope of our uh, gathering of elders, wisdom keepers um, is for all of our uh, tribal communities to um, bring those individuals, you know, it's not just the elders, but it's those natural helpers within our communities that we all know who they are. We rely upon them when something happens in our community. Um, those are the individuals that can help us bring the individuals that need help to the resources that are available for them. Once we get our behavioral health aides uh, trained, it's our community members that knows what is the right way to go when someone needs help. And uh, the goal of our um, gathering of elders, wisdom keepers and natural helpers is to identify our community members that have those roles that bring them to help our, our students and our uh, uh, future generation of behavioral health aides in our communities to uh, be able to mentor them and help them to uh, share those stories and traditions that will help those individuals that have those needs. We all know who they are within our communities, but that is the whole purpose of, of this gathering is to help identify ways that we can bring together and bring forward and share the program that we're developing right now uh, with our community members that can be those mentors for our uh, behavioral health aides that will be working in our communities um, when they get completed with their training. So I just wanted to share that uh, information so that we can be thinking about others in our community that can be 
helping us uh, mentor our behavioral health aides that are going to be beginning their training program um, in January. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, great uh, take home message, Marilyn. Um, I also wanted to invite uh, Carrie Sampson Samuels, our chat director. I know that she wanted to uh, share some uh, closing words also. I saw her in, there we go. Hi everyone. Gosh, it's really hard to go after the words of Marilyn. I think she spoke so well and represented everything that our BHA program um, wants to become. And uh, we're only gonna get there through the teachings and learnings uh, through these different opportunities of our gathering of Northwest elders, knowledge holders and culture keepers. And to echo everyone's sentiments, I just want to, to thank Sue for her opening as she started us off in a good way today. Katie for doing such a beautiful presentation on the BHA education program that we've all been um, working hard to, to uh, bring together and working closely with the college partners that are on the line today. Atai, I, I loved your storytelling. Um, the, your, your words just uh, felt so good to hear and um, your, your, your medicine is definitely um, the gift of storytelling. And I know we all uh, really appreciated your, your sharing your experiences and your vulnerability. And that was just so amazing. Um, Marilyn, again, we can't thank you enough for the time and commitment that you have uh, given our project. If, for those that don't know, we actually meet with Marilyn every two weeks and tap into her um, great uh, knowledge and leadership, and she provides really great direction for our project staff, and we can't thank her enough. And then uh, Tanya, for the, the hard work that you, you did to pull all this together, um, you're, you're becoming an expert, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if others start recognizing and pulling you in their direction as you've really uh, become so great at uh, gathering us all together to share experiences and, and this knowledge. So Katia Ayel, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without, without all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you for those who presented this afternoon, such great words of wisdom, heart and passion and conviction and dedication. And these are the events that I'm so glad that we were able to share with everyone today. So thank you for taking the afternoon to spend with us and to experience that with us. And I know that Katie has an event, an optional event for those who are willing to stay on. But uh, what I'd like to do is ask for a volunteer if they'd be willing to close out our session with the closing blessing. I'll close. Nuka. Song to bring fair weather. You whose day it is. Get out your rainbow colorful. You get out your rainbow color so it may be beautiful. You whose day it is. Get out your rainbow color so it may be beautiful. You whose day it is. Get out your rainbow color so it will be beautiful. We've had a good day, good experience. Thank you. I'm Ed Edmo, Shoshone Bennett. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mr. Edmo. And thank you for those who spent your afternoon with us. Katie, the floor is yours. Hey, everyone. Um, I know it's been a long two days. We touched on topics that were uplifting, a little heavier. Um, so I have my dear friend, Sabrina Mercedes here. Um, I will let her introduce um, herself, themselves. 
Um, she was actually my very first friend at NEA and in Portland when I moved here. Um, she's very dear to me, um, works with the community of indigenous peoples as an advocate um, and just a beautiful soul overall. And um, she's going to do a guided uh, beginners um, yoga for us. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to her to introduce herself and we can get started for those of you who want a little breathing, um, stretching, mindful, um, just to kind of release everything from the last couple of days. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I forget that story that, that I was your first friend in Portland. And um, I just really appreciate all the work that you are doing and all the work that's being done um, at Northwest Indian Health Board. Um, I'm a big fan of whenever Indigenous people can gather and learn and have hard conversations about truth. So it's really an honor to be invited to help you kind of reset for the day and let go. Um, I won't be pushing you too hard and I know it's been a long day probably being virtual the last couple days. So I'm just gonna kind of guide you through some um, you can either sit in your chair or you can stand up, whatever feels most comfortable to you. But go ahead and start by taking a couple breaths and kind of getting, I'm gonna stay sitting in my chair. <clears throat> and I'm gonna sit up nice and tall. And whenever we're doing any sort of yoga, even if it's sitting or laying down, you always kind of wanna think about your posture and your breath. And so we're gonna start with our breath. We're gonna do about um, five minutes of breath and then maybe like 10 to 15 minutes of movement because I know it, you probably wanna get your body moving so that you can continue on with your day. Um, so just start by taking a couple nice deep breaths. You can either, if you really wanna fill your belly, you can breathe in through your mouth almost like you're breathing in through a straw and filling your belly and then releasing. And you can make some noise with that if you want. I always like to because it's like I'm really releasing all that stuff that's in me. So go ahead and keep doing that at your own pace, sitting up nice and strong. Maybe your feet are planted on the floor. And if they are planted on the floor, you maybe want them in a 90 degree angle. Maybe you want to imagine your feet are touching the earth, even if you're not feeling the earth. And go ahead and just root down. Maybe roll your shoulders back a few times, especially if you've been virtual the last couple of days. Maybe move your neck just a little bit, going really nice and slow. Maybe taking one ear to one shoulder. And again, always moving really intentionally and gentle with yourself and just rolling your neck. Maybe taking a pause here so that your chin is all the way to your chest. It's not the most attractive thing, but it helps elongate that spine. And remember to breathe throughout this. If at any point you get frustrated or stressed, just remember to come back to your breath and to release in that way. And maybe let's take a body scan. So a tool that I have used in the past when I was um, a domestic violence advocate was a body scan. I would do this with kids in my life, I still do, um, or you know, with myself when I'm just kind of feeling really heavy. So go ahead and you can soften your gaze or close your eyes if that feels comfortable to you. And go ahead and take some breaths again at your own pace. And maybe do a little body scan. So are there any parts of your body that are specifically like hurting a little bit more or a little bit tighter? And I want you to imagine giving whatever space is maybe tight a color. And as you breathe in, breathe a little breath or relief to whatever part of your body that's kind of hurting. Remembering to take those nice deep breaths and releasing and maybe focusing on that area and breathing some love into it, some patience, some compassion. 
And as you exhale, releasing. And try doing that three more breaths. And don't worry about counting or anything unless that's helpful to you. This is your time. This is your body. And maybe over time, as you continue to breathe, maybe it starts to change color or take shape. Maybe you can imagine it leaving your body. Whatever works for you, whatever feels right to your mind. And if your mind starts to wander, that's perfectly normal. Just continue to breathe. And then go ahead and roll your shoulders back and sit up nice and strong. And then we're gonna add some arm movement. So again, you can do this sitting or you can do it standing, but as you breathe in, bring your arms up as you're breathing in. And as your hands face each other, palms facing each other, nice and strong, and you're sitting up nice and strong, you wanna make sure that your arms aren't like this, hugging your ears, they wanna be dropped away from your shoulders, nice and strong. And maybe you take a little stretch here. And when you go ahead and stretch, just remembering to breathe and then release, and then go ahead and release your arms down. And that's a sun salutation. I try to do sun salutations every morning and I try to bring gratefulness to it. So as I breathe in and my arms are coming up and you can go ahead and do this with me if you'd like, breathe in any sort of goodness or positivity that you took from today, maybe some wisdom or knowledge you wanna hold on to. Hold on to that for a second. And then as you release or exhale, bring your arms down and you're releasing anything you're not, you don't wanna carry on with you for the rest of today. Um, I'm sorry I had to miss these workshops, but they looked really interesting when Katie sent them to me, but um, hopefully next time I'll be able to make it. But go ahead and take two more of those sun salutations, breathing in and taking in all that goodness, all that knowledge, all those connections that you made today. Take a pause here. And then as you release, you're releasing any sort of fear or negativity or heaviness. And I invite everyone, go ahead and do one more sun salutation on your own. I invite everyone to, I'm sure you talked about it, but to go ahead and develop um, a way that maybe you can let go. Maybe you go outside and connect with the earth. Maybe you go to water. Maybe you continue to stretch your body. Maybe take any extra movement right now that might feel good to you. A lot of times we hold um, pain in our bodies and I'm sure that that was probably touched on in some ways, but um, moving our bodies is a way that we can kind of get some of that energy um, uh, out of us. And so always taking time to move nice and slow and just listen to your body, just taking time. A lot of times people say, I can't do yoga because I can't do the poses. It's not really about that. It's really about just connecting to yourself, connecting to your breath and taking that time to connect maybe to your body and your mind. So um, I know it's been a long day, so um, that's all I have for you for now. Um, I am so grateful I got to spend just a little bit of time with all of you. Thank you, Katie, for the invitation. And um, I hope to connect with some of you maybe in the future. Thanks, Sabrina. I know you have your own space and you offer yoga sessions. If you wanted to touch on that quickly and see if anyone was interested. Yeah, so I did my training through Native Strength Revolution, um, the same training that Chandra uh, went through. Um, there's lots of free classes actually by all indigenous peoples from all over Turtle Island. And so I'm not the only person you can take classes from virtually, um, but there's a variety of classes that are taught um, on the Native Strength Revolution website. It's also free. Um, uh, another indigenous, um, 
free yoga program that uh, I work with is Rising Hearts Yoga, which is based in Canada. Um, and that one is another um, donation based or is access accessible for free um, virtually all from all over. So please check those out. Thank you. Like I said, Sabrina is my soul sister and I'm just so grateful she could come in um, a little last minute and um, offer that stretch for you all. So I really hope you enjoyed that. Um, it was a nice way for you to end our Zoom. I will hand it over again to Tanya. She has anything else to say before we close. No, it's great to see that we still had some folks still on the link. I think uh, some of us needed to kind of unwind and decompress and and um, take care of ourselves, you know, and that self care. So that was really good to see. Looks like we get, we're getting some chats. Uh, so for Sabrina, do you know of any yoga for elders providing virtually? Providing yeah, so uh, I'm based, I forgot to mention, I'm based actually in Mikado or Mankato, Minnesota, um, where the Dakota 38 plus two were ordered to be hung um, in 1862. And in Minneapolis, also where the American Indian movement originated, um, we have indigenous lotus yoga, which I will put in the chat. And Victoria offers a lot of virtual classes for elders. Um, also with Native Strength Revolution, we do offer um, a variety. I know one of my teachers just did an elders class. Um, a lot of times also um, you can read the descriptions and they kind of say like which level um, people can teach um, on, but I will definitely, I'm trying to put these all in the chat so that you can um, access them because there's three, three or four of them that I know of um, that are offered pretty regularly. Um, and it's been amazing to see the health benefits that have come um, with elders that I did my yoga training with. Um, it, it really is limitless to anybody who is passionate about connecting with the culture as well um, and just learning from other indigenous teachers. So Sabrina, any of the links that uh, you provide our participants, I will definitely make sure to share that when we do our closeout um, email announcement. Perfect, thank you. We are right on schedule, folks. This is great. Everyone did such a wonderful job. What do you think, Katie? I am just so grateful to share this space. I wish we were in person, but so many great storytelling it was truly good medicine and please if you know anyone who would be a good fit for a bha like i said we are still recruiting a handful of students for both institutions start thinking about if you know anyone who would be a good fit um that is my priority right now um so please don't hesitate to call me or text me call me you want to see, I don't know how that here it goes, but I'm available and here to provide support to anyone who's interested in pursuing an educational pathway. Um, plus you get money and it paid for potentially for doing it. So um, yeah, I'm here if you need me and just feeling really grateful for the last two days. So thank you, Tanya, too, for, for everything that you did. Yeah, thank you, Katie, for helping. I'm going to stay on for um, a few more moments in case if there's uh, folks that um, have any last minute questions or just want to have, you know, a side conversation. I will keep this link open for a little bit longer for anyone who wants to uh, share or or has a question. Katie, would you be able to stay on also? Yeah, I'll be here.
Hey, Tanya, um, where can I find the recordings for this event since I missed today, like half of it because I was at work? Yeah, good question. We will actually be, uh, we're going to be uh, recording. This recording will be saved on YouTube and we'll be sending the link out when we uh, send out our closeout to all of our participants. And we'll also include the uh, handouts that all of our presenters shared. Perfect. Thank you so much. I got to go, but I, I really, really enjoyed yesterday's and part of today's that I got to see anyway. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Coletta. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, I really, really enjoy these kind of events. <laughs> it really helps me in my life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it looks like we're getting some more additional um, resources for yoga. Great, we'll share that, Terry. All right, Katie. I'll let you call it. Should we conclude today's session? I think so. I'm going to drink some water, stretch, reflect, write. But I think it went really, really well. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. I've been kind of multitasking. I have one more invoice to do. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I can squeak that in with, with Olivia before she logs off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we're I think we're safe to call it. Okay. All right. Good night. Good night. Terry, please feel free to email me. I'll get your email. Bye, everyone.